welcome back for another Sheriff Studying video. Today I'm going to talk about the USMLE for DOs and the future of the National Board of Osteopathic Medical Examiners. I'm making this video because over the past few years I've found myself in the middle of a fight. On one side are DO medical students. They're fed up with the de facto requirement that they take two licensing exams. Now the issue here is that residency program directors prefer USMLE. Some programs explicitly require USMLE scores in order to be considered for an interview. Others may not require it, but they seem to give advantage or preference to applicants who come with USMLE scores when they apply. And among students who take both COMLEX and USMLE, there seems to be this general perception that the USMLE is a better test. The questions are cleaner, better written. And actually, there's only a handful of state medical boards that require DOs to take COMLEX. The vast majority of boards, as we'll look at later, will license a DO who completes the USMLE. So the students say, why can't we just take the USMLE? Why are we forced to take COMLEX? So on the other side, you've got the NBOME, the National Board of Osteopathic Medical Examiners. And they're saying, well, of course you gotta take Comlex USA because only Comlex USA is designed for osteopathic physicians and only Comlex USA tests osteopathic principles. So take USMLE if you want, but you're still gonna have to take our three-part examination series. And yeah, each part's gonna cost you between $700 and $900. Now, let me tell you, I don't have a dog in this fight. I'm not a DO student. I'm not even a DO. I don't have any affiliation whatsoever with the NBOME. I don't even have any interactions with them except for maybe the occasional Twitter dust up. Um, for the record, I don't have any affiliation with the USMLE or the National Board of Medical Examiners, the, the organization that brings that test to you either. I don't have a dog in this fight. But, um, but I think the students are right here. And because I don't have any skin in the game, I'm not shy to talk about it. And eventually the NBOME is gonna lose on this issue. So what I'm gonna do in this video is lay out what I think they should do to stop this fight and, and ensure that their organization survives. But first, because it's foundational to everything that comes next, I've gotta quickly lay out why I believe the students are right and why the NBOME is eventually gonna lose. So these are the truths that I hold to be self-evident. And if you disagree with me, that's fine. But I'm going to want to know which of these premises you believe to be untrue. The first is DOs should not have to take two licensing exams. It's expensive, unnecessary, and duplicative. And actually, I think on this point, everyone agrees. It's just that DO students, or at least a majority of them, believe that that single exam should be the USMLE. And the NBOME, of course, well, they believe it should be COMLEX. Second. Licensing examinations exist to protect the public. The purpose of USMLE and COMLEX is to ensure that state medical boards only license physicians who are competent. These exams are not intended to enforce a certain philosophy. They're not intended to measure a physician's distinctiveness. They're intended to ensure that physicians who provide care to real patients have the requisite foundational knowledge and skill to do so. The third truth that I hold to be self-evident is this, that the definition of competent medical care doesn't vary between MDs and DOs. Look guys, this is not the 1800s when DOs were out there treating diphtheria with cervical manipulation and MDs were treating them with mercury. Nowadays, if God forbid you ever saw a real life patient with diphtheria, any doctor is gonna treat it the same way, assuming that they have the skill to recognize or at least consider that diagnosis. The practical reality is that in our modern healthcare system, MDs and DOs function interchangeably. Both are going to be held to the same evidence-based standard of care. Now you could say, but, 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 but DOs are more holistic or, or more patient-centered or, or whatever. But in a very practical sense, those differences really just amount to differences in practice styles. They do not constitute some entirely different standard of medical competence. And, and look, there's plenty of room for some differences in, pra in practice style. Some doctors, uh, they may be quick to get an MRI for a patient with low back pain. Some may try medications or PT first. But, but any doctor ought to know that a patient with ST elevation and chest pain is having a STEMI and they need to go to the cath lab. 
Again, the minimum competence needed for medical practice is what these licensing exams are intended to evaluate. They're not intended to evaluate practice philosophy or practice style. These tests exist to protect the public, and I just do not believe that there is one standard for safe, competent medical practice for MDs and another entirely separate standard for DOs. And that brings me to my fourth self-evident truth which is that the USMLE adequately assesses physician competence, at least the portions of physician competence that can be assessed with a written exam. Any DO who passes the USMLE ought to be eligible for licensure, and actually in almost all states they are. So what I'm showing you here are the examinations that are accepted for initial licensure of osteopathic physicians by state. The blue states are states that accept USMLE or Comlex USA. Only those red states, that handful of red states, require that DOs take Comlex USA. I honestly don't know of any legitimate reason, and it's not for lack of trying, but I honestly do not know of any legitimate reason why a DO who passes the USMLE should not be eligible for licensure in any state. And if you want to make that argument, then go ahead, but I think you have only two logical ways that you could justify it. One is that, I mean, you could claim that the USMLE is just an inadequate exam, that um, it doesn't really evaluate competence. But if you make that claim, well, well, buddy, we got a real problem on our hands because MDs are using the USMLE to acquire licenses to practice medicine and surgery every day. So the other way you could try to, to, to justify such a position would be you could claim that the USMLE doesn't assess the competencies that you need for osteopathic medical practice. And of course, that's what most complex defenders do. Here's a recent call out I got on Twitter. Dr. Carmody is correct. Comlex USA is a licensing exam. It exists to protect the public by ensuring licensed osteopathic physicians possess minimum competency in osteopathic medicine. So I asked, what competencies other than osteopathic manipulative therapies are not assessed by the USMLE, but are necessary for safe osteopathic medical practice? And let me tell you, I never got an answer. But um, if you can't even articulate what the competencies are that are tested on Comlex, then I, I don't know how you could possibly be so confident that they're absolutely necessary for DO medical practice. And that leads me into my fifth and final self-evident truth, because we do have to figure out what to do with that one competency, which is tested on Comlex USA, but not on USMLA, and that's osteopathic manipulative therapy. But here again, I hold it to be self-evident that OMT could be adequately assessed on a separate exam. You absolutely could, if you were so inclined, you absolutely could capably assess OMT in some way other than by including questions about it on each part of a three-part computer-based examination series. And, and I mean logically, using a multiple choice question exam to, to assess OMT, that's probably not the best way to do it anyhow, right? I mean, to the extent that OMT needs to be assessed as a condition of licensure, wouldn't it be better assessed by a practical exam run by the NBOME or just the osteopathic medical schools? And here, it's probably important to acknowledge that there's an increasingly small proportion of DOs who actually use OMT in their clinical practice. Last year, there was this paper in the Journal of Osteopathic Medicine. They, um, they sent a survey to a random sampling of 10,000 osteopathic physicians asking how often they use osteopathic manipulative treatments in their own practice. 57% said they do not use it, ever. Another 21% said they use it in less than 5% of their patients. Now, this is survey data, and the response rate for this survey was only 17%. But I think you got to ask, who's more likely to take time out of their day to fill out a survey about OMT? People who do OMT or people who don't do OMT? My instinct is that the results that this survey found is, is almost a best case kind of scenario. And in fact, there are other data that suggest that only 10% or less of DOs actually employ OMT in their clinical practice. Many colleges of osteopathic medicine these days are, are struggling to recruit faculty to teach OMT. And honestly, even if you teach it in medical school, it's hard to keep up that proficiency in residency if your attendings aren't using it in their practice. So honestly, even if you care deeply about OMT and you feel that it needs to be protected, the current training system doesn't seem to be doing that. And you honestly may not have much to lose by reimagining an educational and certification pathway for OMT.
So all of that, those five premises, which I think are largely unrebutted, um, that's to tell you why I believe the DO students are right. They should not have to take two licensure exams. Their suitability for medical licensure can be adequately assessed by the USMLE in a world where DOs and MDs are working side by side in residency and beyond. But now I gotta tell you why I think the DO students are gonna win, because just being right doesn't necessarily mean that you're gonna win the fight. But there's a very simple reason why the DO students are gonna win this battle, and it's because they've got the numbers. But before I explain what I mean, let me tell you something else about this debate. Um, whenever I talk about this issue, I guess, in pushback, but the interesting thing is that pushback always comes from the same place. The pushback exclusively and universally comes from the DO leadership. When someone tweets something like this, saying that the osteopathic profession has reaffirmed its position that Comlex is the appropriate licensure exam for DOs, however many likes something like this gets, I can tell you exactly who they're from. Every single non-anonymous account is going to have some leadership title with the AOA or the NBOME or some other osteopathic leadership organization. My sense is that um, supporting Comlex is, is kind of like a, a litmus test for getting one of these leadership positions. Kind of like um, abortion can be a litmus, litmus test for political parties in the United States. You've got to support the whole package deal of beliefs, the whole package deal of osteopathic governance, or they're not going to support you or your application for leadership. So anybody who wants to maintain their leadership position or anyone who has aspirations of getting one of those nice leadership jobs, well, you better toe the party line. But I'll tell you, I never, I honestly never see rank and file DOs jump in to defend Comlex. The average DO who wants to get into residency or take care of patients or achieve some kind of career success other than serving in a leadership uh, role for the osteopathic organizations, I never see them jumping in to white knight for Comlex. But the thing is, the demographics of the osteopathic profession are shifting. Over the past 20 years, there's been an almost exponential growth in the number of colleges of osteopathic medicine. And accordingly, there's now been almost exponential growth in the number of osteopathic physicians. There are almost twice as many DOs out there now as there were just 10 years ago. There are three times as many now as there were 20 years ago, and almost five times as many now as there were 30 years ago. What that means is that this older generation of DO physicians, the generation that disproportionately still controls all of the DO governance and leadership organizations, that generation is rapidly getting outnumbered. Here are real data from the AOA. Only 13% of DOs are in the 55 to 64 year old governing class. In contrast, 35% of DOs are under 35 years old. 68% of DOs are less than 45. And over time, these groups are going to continue to grow and assume more power and influence. Old leaders are going to retire, and uh, new ones are going to come from these younger generations. And you can say, well, you know, maybe the AOA will just continue to vet its current leaders to enforce the same belief system and maintain the exact same policies that they do now. And, and they might. But um, if they do, I think it's going to be organizational suicide. One reason I got into this issue is because I kept hearing from so many angry students, students that feel taken advantage of by the NBOME. They felt that um, the DO leadership was just extractive and only interested in protecting themselves and their positions and their wallets. And, and all of this reached a crescendo during the COVID-19 pandemic with the NBOME's handling of the clinical skills exam. But let me tell you, there is real anger from many students on these issues. And if you haven't heard that, you must be trying not to hear it. The point is, there's a generation of DO students who I don't think feels any great loyalty or affinity to their governance. And you can't have an advocacy organization like the AOA that's out of step with its members. They're not going to join. They're not going to pay their dues. But unlike the AMA, which doesn't really need to make money on dues because they make money hand over fist on royalties since they own the coding system that we all use, but the AOA needs numbers. And so soon they're going to have to choose between serving the needs of the younger generation or the old. And the average DO student or DO in training cares a lot more about their own career and practice opportunities than they do about maintaining someone else's view about what makes a DO distinctive. If you doubt the truth in what I'm saying, let me share with you a resolution from the Student Osteopathic Medical Association that passed in 2020. 
it calls for that student organization to adopt a position that Comlex USA shouldn't be required for graduation or osteopathic medical school accreditation. I want you to think on that for a minute. These are medical students and they're not afraid of being ostracized or punished for having this heretical belief. This isn't some fringe movement. It is absolutely mainstream. These are the future DO leaders right here, and they believe that Comlex USA requirements hurt the profession. It hurts DO students in the wallet. They're taking money that they're borrowing at the prevailing student interest rates and funneling it to people who are already very generously compensated. But it's not just a transient financial hit. I think that there's a recognition that insisting on Comlex USA, it hurts DOs professionally. The reality is we live in a world in which anti-DO discrimination persists. The reasons at this point are largely historical. I mean, in the year 2023, the core scientific medical education that you receive in a DO school is fundamentally the same as what you receive in an MD school. But I think most young DOs realize that um, trying to maintain this separate but equal licensing standard, it doesn't help DOs when they're trying to fight for professional equality or get into places where they're still excluded. Because if you take this position that Comlex is the only examination that DOs can take, it, it kind of forces you into this act of Orwellian doublethink. You've got to try to accept that two competing beliefs are true. On the one hand, you've got to argue that DOs and MDs are equivalent in every way. But on the other, you've got to say that DOs can't possibly be held to the same licensing standard as MDs. And this is just not an easy position to defend. Maybe I'm missing something. I mean, that's what people tell me at least when I start to talk about these issues and these same people pop up and say, well, you know, you're not a DO. You don't understand osteopathic principles. You don't understand what it means to be an osteopathic physician who has a leadership role in the AOA or aspirations of having the same. You don't understand these things. If we give up Comlex, we'll be no different than MDs. A DO and MD, it'll just all be the same. We're giving up everything. And to that, all I can say is I call BS. Show me a physician who values their osteopathic colleagues, and I will show you a physician who values them because of their clinical skills. Show me a patient who values their osteopathic physician, and, and, and maybe it's because they like the OMT, or maybe it's because that physician was willing to come to a rural area or takes a, a patient-centered holistic approach. Whatever the reason is, I can guarantee you that the number of people who would cite Comlex as being the reason that they liked their osteopathic physician colleague or, or personal physician, that number is going to be as near as zero as it could possibly be. How many patients do you think have even heard the word Comlex? I don't think that that's a, a valid reason. Um, but I'll tell you what I think part of the reason is. And, um, and this isn't just me shooting from the hip. This is a reason that's been explicitly expressed to me by several osteopathic medical school deans that I've had conversations with over the past couple of years. And that reason is that um, we need Comlex because there's a certain group of osteopathic medical students that, that might pass Comlex USA on their first try, but they're going to struggle to pass USMLE. And this is not just speculation. It's suggested by a number of studies that have looked at the correlation between USMLE and COMLEX scores. Um, and that includes the NBOME's own concordance study that they published in the journal Graduate Medical Education last year. So here's the key table from that article. And you can see how various scores on COMLEX USA Level 1 and Level 2 CE correspond to scores on USMLE Step 1 and Step 2 CK. Now here, you got to remember that the passing score on Comlex USA is 400, but the passing score on USMLE Step 1 is now 196. Even though it's a pass-fail test, you still have to score the equivalent of a 196 to pass. And that means that test takers who have a Comlex USA score of 400 to 460, they would pass the Comlex, but not the USMLE, assuming that they get their most likely, their, their concordant score. For USMLE Step 2 CK, the passing score is now 214. So again, test takers who score under around 460, 470 on Comlex, they may not pass if they're getting their most likely score on the USMLE. And this is not a small group. It's around 15 to 20% of test takers, depending on the test year. Now, in fairness, I need to say, you know, the NBOME has a rebuttal on this. They say that that's not the reason for any of this. They say, you know, of course, DO students score lower on the USMLE because it's not their test. And they spend hundreds of hours learning things like OMT that aren't tested on USMLE. 
Maybe. Now look, if you know me, you know I'm not some kind of standardized test apologist, but I think it's fair to acknowledge that there are systematic differences between DO and MD students in terms of their standardized test performance. If you look at MCAT scores for entering students in 2021, the average MCAT score for a DO matriculant was around 504 or 505. That puts you around the 60th percentile. If you look at MCAT scores for MD matriculants, they're around 511 or 512, which is around the 80th percentile. It stands to reason that these differences don't just disappear when you enter medical school. And in fact, that percentile difference, that 20 point percentile difference is mirrored in the NBOME's concordance data where on average, there's a 20 point percentile difference in scores between COMLEX and USMLE. In other words, on average, a DO who scores in the 80th percentile on COMLEX scores in around the 60th percentile of USMLE. So I think this concern from the deans is legitimate, but the real question is, what do you do about it? If you're playing the short game and, and your goal is just to be able to expand the number of DO schools and the enrollment of each school, and you don't want to be constrained by having some students who struggle to pass the national licensing exam, well, sure, protecting COMLEX may allow you to achieve those goals. But if you're playing the long game, and if you're in a leadership position for your school, you really ought to be, and you care about the value, the long-term value of the DO degree, I don't think this is a good strategy. You should not be afraid to have a higher standard. But let me tell you this too. As a side note, some of the same deans that have concerns about how there's a certain group of students that could pass COMLEX but not USMLE, those same deans also have concerns about the rapid expansion of colleges of osteopathic medicine. And they have concerns that class sizes are getting too big. But they tell me that, um, that there's nothing they can do. They say, that genie's out of the bottle. It can't be put back. You know, if a group of investors came forward today and wanted to start a new college of osteopathic medicine, you can't deny them accreditation just because it's a new school or because you think you've got enough schools already. Um, that's not really allowed. That, that would be illegal. If, if the new school meets the minimum standard that you've used for previous schools, then you're going to have to let them in or you're going to face a big lawsuit and it's going to be funded by the deep pocketed investors or the state actors who wanted to have the, that new school. And so what I'm trying to communicate to these deans and get them to realize is that, that maintaining standards is a way to fix that problem too. Because if you grow the number of schools beyond the natural growth in the number of highly qualified applicants, then you're going to start to let in some students on the margins who aren't going to be able to establish that they have the competency to provide safe medical care. And then you'd have a natural and justifiable limit on future growth that, that wouldn't run afoul of antitrust laws. Now, of course, there's another reason beyond distinctiveness or worries about first-time USMLE pass rates that influences the defense of COMLEX. And I'm going to be frank about what that reason is. It's financial. The NBOME is in a very good market position. They have a captive audience that, because of the COCA accreditation requirements, that audience has no choice but to take the exam they provide at whatever price they choose to provide it. It's a pretty good business model. And in 2020, the NBOME took in revenues of nearly 26 million. The CEO took home compensation of over $600,000, which isn't as much as some CEOs, but again, you gotta remember that the number of DOs is growing exponentially, which means that these figures are gonna grow exponentially too. And folks, there's nothing wrong with making money, but when you make $600,000 a year doing something, you have a strong incentive to see issues through a certain lens. And it's fair that we all acknowledge that. In fact, it's the whole reason that these financial figures are a matter of public record. It's not shameful to talk about them. They're public record for a reason, and it's so that they can be acknowledged in debates like this. Now, there was an interesting part of that SOMA resolution that I showed you a few minutes ago. The, the students opined that they believed that the NBOME's financial viability should not be considered as relevant to the discussion. And I agree. But... I also live in the real world, and I know you can't run a business that takes in $26 million a year and will double in the next five to seven years and just close up shop for no reason. So I'm going to explicitly consider the finances in the final part of this talk, which is where I'm going to finally tell you what I believe the NBOME's options are moving forward and what they ought to do. Option one is to hold the line. Right now, the NBOME enjoys substantial support from the rest of the DO leadership apparatus. 
So why do they have to change anything? Why not just hold the line and fight hard to maintain political support among the people that matter so that you can maintain your position moving forward? It could work. Um, I mean, honestly, the fact that USMLE Step 1 moved to pass-fail removed one big threat to the NBO and me, because now DO students only feel obligated to take a single USMLE exam, that's Step 2CK. Like I said, support for the current DO leadership may be eroding in the current generation, but um, it's still going to be a while till, uh, till those folks are in a position to do anything about it. And maybe by the time that they're rising into leadership roles, maybe the, that sting of having to take two licensing exams, maybe that will have passed. Or maybe they could be enticed by the power of a leadership position, and you can use their position on maintaining Comlex um, as, a, as a litmus test for their fitness for leadership, just like we talked about before. And really, all you need to do is two things to maintain your current market position. The first and most important is that you need to maintain some influence over COCA so that they continue to subscribe to the belief that Comlex is indispensable and they continue to mandate that schools require their students to take it as a condition of accreditation. The second thing that you got to do is you got to protect the medical boards in that handful of states that still require Comlex for initial licensure. So you're going to want to keep a close eye on things that are going on in Florida and California and Pennsylvania, and you're going to do some lobbying to keep the right people on the board or to keep the board from considering changing their licensing standards to accept the USMLE. Option two is to seek a merger. What I mean is, let's say you were truly worried that you were going to lose your authority or position. Well, maybe it's better to merge while you're still in a position of relative strength. There might be some lessons here from a decade ago when the AOA was getting squeezed by the growing pipeline of DO students and the ACGME's new residency accreditation standards. And they began to see the writing on the wall and they begrudgingly realized that it was going to be better for them and better for the osteopathic profession to have a single residency accreditation system. Now, make no mistake, the, the NBOME is in a much stronger position than the AOA's accreditation system was. The AOA was going to lose, and um, any Monday morning quarterback who waxes poetic about the good old days when DOs controlled their own residency system and acts like they shouldn't have given it up, those folks either don't understand the practical realities of what that situation was, or they're just trying to pull the wool over your eyes. The best thing that the AOA could have done in that situation was use their current position as leverage to gain some influence in the new system. And, and that's what they did by getting some new positions um, on the ACGME board set aside for them. So the NBOME certainly does not have to concede, but, but they could. Um, and I'll mention this option for completeness. They have test making expertise and they have expert psychometricians and a big bank of test questions. So in theory, you could imagine a world in which they began to work with the NBME to offer a single exam. Maybe that exam could even have a few questions on osteopathic principles thrown in for DO test takers, and scores could be reported with that designation if you wanted. It would potentially be a great deal for the NBME because the NBOME would bring a ton of new test takers and significant growth potential. And it would also get rid of that silly separate but equal licensing standard that hurts DOs and the need for two licensing exams for DO students. So it'd be a win for them too. But um, this option would not feel like a win for the NBOME or the other DO leadership that supports them. So realistically, this ain't going to happen. And that brings me to option three, which is to concede and pivot. I'm going to explain what I mean. So just close your eyes and dream with me. Suppose the NBOME did a SWOT analysis looking for threats, and they, they acknowledge that one of the biggest threats to their organization is this growing resentment from the younger generation of DOs. And so maybe they say, well, maybe the best thing to do to get rid of that threat is to stop doing things that are alienating this generation of students, like, oh, I don't know, extracting exam fees for a test that seems unnecessary to the average student and is unhelpful for improving their career prospects. And maybe instead they pivot and use their expertise and infrastructure instead to create and offer exams that actually could improve residency selection prospects for DOs and maybe even osteopathic medical education in general. If I were the CEO of the NBOME, this is what I'd do. I'd look at the universe of residency selection and I would notice that there's a lot of places where it's very hard for DOs to get their foot in the door. Across the board, in every single specialty, match rates are lower for DO applicants than MD applicants. And the more competitive the specialty, the more the disparity. The match rates for DOs in anesthesiology was 66% versus 90% for MDs. 
For general surgery, it was 62% versus 82%. For neurosurgery, 74% for MDs, 43% for DOs. And in 2022, the match rates for DOs trying to get into integrated plastic surgery programs was 0%. This is a problem that's not going to get better by forcing students to take Comlex and saying that they're equal. So what I do, if you made me the CEO of the MBO and me, is I'd go to program directors in these competitive specialties and I'd ask, tell me, what are the competencies and skills that you want your interns to have on day one? What are the things that, if your interns knew this coming in the door, you could move that much faster educationally and get that much farther by the time the residency was done? What are the skills that, that I, as a leader of a testing organization, could certify to you as being solid skills? And, and, and that certification would make you give these applicants a look when they apply to your program. And whatever they say, then I'm going to go out and I'm going to build those assessments. Here, the MBOME could follow the example of the College Board. The College Board, of course, is, is the biggest test-making organization in the country. They make the SAT. But they also administer the Advanced Placement Program. And as you probably all know, that's a program in which highly motivated high schoolers can take college-level entry courses. And instead of those colleges having to take the word that the individual high school says, oh, yeah, that's a college-level course, well, the College Board gives an exam. And it's graded on a one to five scale and scores um, of three to five, depending on the college, may get accepted as college credit or at least placement into higher level courses after the student enrolls. So you challenge the DO schools to teach high level stuff. And then you, as the NBOME, you offer to assess it. And you're in a position as a neutral body to do that and to do it with authority. And students could choose which among a giant catalog of specific exams they want to take to show their stuff. So you want to show that you know how to do motivational interviewing? Well, here's a five on my NBOME motivational interviewing exam to show you uh, as the internal medicine program director that I got that skill. You want to know that, uh, that I can interpret chest radiographs? Well, here, come take this NBOME exam. We're going to give you a queue of cases to review and, and, and assess your performance. Ever since step one with pass fail, we've had program directors in competitive fields like neurosurgery and otolaryngology whining that no one's going to learn basic science anymore. So guess what? We'll make a specialty specific exam that assesses at a high level the basic science that's relevant to those fields. And it doesn't have to be just written exams either. You could have practical exams. I mean, you've got facilities that are built for it. Um, so if you want to prove to programs that you can do basic suturing, or run a code, or whatever it is that they want you to do in their program or in their specialty, the NBOME could help you demonstrate that. And if I were the CEO of the NBOME, I would give students the option to release their scores or not. If you take the exam and do poorly, I don't want to hurt your chances of getting into residency. I want you to know that you need to improve those skills, that you haven't mastered them yet, but I'm going to let you decide which of the scores for the exams you take that you choose to release the programs. And I'm not going to require the exams, and I would strongly discourage any school from requiring the exams. It'll be like AP exams. Some people choose to take AP U.S. History. Some people choose to take AP Calculus. Some people take both. Some people take neither. The point would be, if you want to challenge yourself to learn something at a high level, go for it. But different students are going to have different goals, and they're going to want to demonstrate their merit in different ways. And this is a solution that I see as a win-win. Obviously, the NBOME wins because now they're out of the firing line for all this anger over Comlex. They've got a different revenue stream that still has significant growth potential, maybe even more than just the growth that you'd see in this three-part exam Comlex series. DO students are going to win because now they get a tool that they can use to compete in residency selection. And although there may be some pressure to take the exams and demonstrate your competency, I still think it's a better system than having a one-size-fits-all measuring stick like USMLE Step 1 or Step 2 CK, which results in a more pernicious arms race. And yeah, I would have some reservations about the cost of these tests, but I don't think that most people object to paying for things that add value. You can go to a high-end steakhouse or you can go to McDonald's and you don't hear people complaining about the cost of food. You know where you hear people complaining? When they go to the movie theater and someone charges them $12 for a, a bag of Skittles. If you make high quality assessments and those assessments add value, I don't think students will mind paying a fair price for them. 
medical education is going to win because many students are going to be inspired to learn certain things at a higher level. And even better, the things that they're going to learn are going to be things that are relevant to what they think their future practice is going to be. And last, I think even patients would win because, look, the reality is that there's always going to be winners and losers in residency selection. Not everybody who wants to is going to get to be an orthopedic surgeon. There's not enough spots. But for the folks who don't match in orthopedics, there's still going to be someone's doctor. And given that there's always going to be winners and losers, the best we can do is structure the competition so that even those who don't ultimately win still become better doctors for having competed. And if we test real world doctor skills, if we make meaningful assessments, those things will eventually come in handy, even if it doesn't open the door for residency selection in the way that you'd hoped it might. Now, will the NBOME do any of this? Of course not. It's just a pipe dream. Part of the reason I make these videos is to try to get people to think. And thanks for listening to this one.